Thank you. So dear students, colleagues, friends, welcome to the Sinophone Classicism Lecture Series. My name is Zhi Yang, Professor of Sinology at Goethe University Frankfurt and organizer of the series. Today, for the final talk of the summer semester, I am honored to have Michelle Ye, Distinguished Professor of Chinese Literature and Comparative Literature at University of California, Davis. In the last few decades, Professor Ye has been a leading voice in the research on traditional and modern Chinese poetry, as well as comparative poetics. Her monographs and edited volumes, such as Modern Chinese Poetry, Theory and Practice since 1917, Anthology of Chinese Poetry and Frontier Taiwan to Raise but a Few Titles, have been standard reference works for students of Chinese poetry. So I will stop uh, from reading the long list of publications in case it gets uh, too long. I had the chance of meeting Michelle virtually through talks organized by the Russian Lyric in Transition project at the University of Clear, summer semester 2021. She gave an inspiring talk uh, provocatively titled Why Modern Chinese Poetry, which investigates, among other things, and I quote, how modern Chinese poetry has faced significant challenges as a result of structural changes and the fetishization of classical poetry. <laughs> well, my talk given a month later might have been well followed suit and been called Why Contemporary Chinese Classicist Poetry, as it analyzes, among other things, how the canonization of vernacular Chinese modern poetry has led to the marginalization of contemporary classicist poetry. And yet, despite the seemingly mirrored temporal and thematic polarity of our positions, we find ourselves in agreement on most issues. And Michelle's kindness and grace toward a junior scholar have greatly encouraged me to further pursue this topic. So I thank you, Michelle, very much. So it is therefore of special significance of me personally to find myself in the same camp today as Michelle, as we set out to explore various textual articulations and cultural phenomena that can be termed as Sinophone classicism, disseminated primarily digitally across the world today. I know many students just like myself have been anticipating this talk. For housekeeping reasons, I must remind the uh, audience that the talk will be video recorded and later made available on the Forschungskolleg Human Wissenschaften's YouTube channel. If you do not wish to appear in the recording, please turn off your camera. The Q&A session following the talk will not be recorded. So when you raise your question, you can unmute yourself and turn on the camera. And please use the raise a hand button, which is at the bottom, you can find it at the bottom of the Zoom uh, page to enter the queue for questions. You will find the button once you click reactions. Without further ado, Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ji, for your generous introduction. And uh, definitely we've shared a lot of happy memories of scholarly exchange. Um, so really, I want to thank you for inviting me to do this um, series. And it, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. And, um, uh, and also um, even more broadly, I want to thank Zhi for uh, inviting me to join her project on Sinophone classes and in digital times. And uh, so what I'm presenting today is part of that project and it's very much a work in progress. In fact, about an hour before this talk, I was still tweaking my PowerPoint. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna share my point, point, PowerPoint with you in a few minutes. Um, but before I start, um, I also want to apologize for my voice because I lost my voice about two, three weeks ago. So it's slowly coming back, but it's still not 100%. So I apologize for that. And sometimes I may have to pause to uh, drink some water. So anyway, so I'm going to talk about um, classes drama uh, in digital times by classes drama. I mean, these costume drama series uh, in China. And, uh, and I'm going to focus on two uh, particular series as case studies. 
Uh, so I'm going to share uh, the PowerPoint with you now. Okay, there. So first, I guess a very short overview of the rise of internet drama series in China since 2007. And of course, a lot has happened since then and the evolution is nothing short of dramatic. And, and later I think we'll get a sense of it uh, when we talk about the two drama series. Uh, but there are certain advantages to producing internet drama series in China. Uh, number one, and definitely at the beginning it was true, is that uh, the lower costs in production and promotion. In terms of production, uh, definitely we noticed that uh, usually it's young actors who were featured in these early drama series. Well, this is situation actually lasted for a long time, uh, even in the case of The Untamed in, in 2018, uh, they were really two relatively new actors. So we'll talk about that some more. So in terms of production, definitely uh, you saved a lot of money, uh, but also in terms of promotion, uh, most of these drama series didn't do any promotion uh, before they were launched online. And the second thing is, I think equally important, if not more important, that is actually when you do internet drama series, you enjoy greater freedom uh, in terms of theme. And, uh, and, and needless to say, uh, there is censorship in China. In order to bypass that, I think the internet, at least at the beginning, was really a good strategy. Uh, so we know that in China, uh, there is National Radio and Television Administration. So it keeps a close eye on what is being shown on TV. And of course, now we're talking about internet and we have the Cyberspace Administration of China. And that was found, uh, founded as early as 2011, but really it didn't uh, work that powerfully until uh, more recently, I think since 2019 for sure, it has stepped up on its oversight of everything that happens on the internet. And another advantage to internet drama series is that you don't need to worry about prime time anymore. This notion has become obsolete uh, when you no longer show drama series exclusively or mainly on TV, right? Because it is available 24 seven. So this is a great advantage. Um, there is no fixed schedule anymore. You can watch it anytime, any place you like. And so this really appeals to young people who are savvy in technology, right? And also given their lifestyle, I think this is just something they really like a lot. Uh, social media and so on. So this is another advantage. And, and related to that, audiences also feel that they can participate more or instantly sometimes um, in, the, uh, in the drama series that is being shown online. Uh, we all know the use of a bullet, a bullet screen, for instance, you can, you can put comments on the screen and I personally find that annoying, but I think it's a way for the audience to interact with one another in a way, all members of the audience are there. So this really creates an intimate community. And this sense of intimacy is actually very important on the internet, not limited to drama series, but in terms of drama series, this is also true. And this leads to a different kind of fandom that we will talk about later on in my presentation. And finally, um, not only in terms of time, there is so much freedom, so much flexibility, uh, but also in terms of space, in terms of geography. These drama series are <clears throat> released domestically and globally at the same time in most cases. So that of course increases the appeal of the drama series. So the biggest names, some of the biggest names, as we can see here, right? They have uh, invested in internet drama uh, so much that since I would say since 2018 or 19, it has become the mainstream uh, in terms of drama series. And later we can say more about that. Uh, and also IP business model. This is a different business model from TV drama series, for instance, or TV programs in general. Right, so basically what is happening here is that these investors 
uh, look for the next big name, the next brand, right? It's all about branding. And branding here is, is multifaceted. And later I will say more about that in relation to the untamed, which is one of the best examples of this IP business model. So the first case study here is uh, Royal Nirvana, uh, Hele Hua Ting. Uh, I don't know how many of you have watched this series, but I'm a big fan of this series. Uh, probably that's obvious. And I would encourage you to watch it if you haven't. And there is a sequel, which is um, also called Royal Nirvana, even though the Chinese title obviously is different, it's uh, Bie Yun Jian. And uh, so here, so this is based on, based on an, an internet um, novel, uh, Royal Nirvana on Xinjiang Wenxie Cheng, right? Xinjiang Literature City is uh, the biggest name, really, when it comes to one of the biggest names, at least, when it comes to online fiction. And uh, you have the dates there, right? It was first posted on January 15, 2008, right? So as of today, I checked this morning, right? There are more than 128 million uh, views. So that's quite incredible. Uh, so it was a big hit even when it was first serialized on Jingjiang Wen Cheng. And the author, the name is Self, right? It is based on poetry, classical poetry, right? So here I quote the source of her pen name, but we don't have to go into these lines um, due to time constraints. So, and also the title of this story, He Li Hua Ting, right? It's actually a classical illusion to Lu Ji, one of the uh, one of the great poets um, in traditional China, and before he was executed, he expressed his uh, longing for his home, right where he, he could hear cranes cry. So cranes, in this case, symbolize freedom, spiritual freedom in particular, right? So this is very important. <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in the drama series, um, the the image of the crane. Uh, happens quite a few times, uh, but also this whole sentiment, this whole longing for freedom, right, away from politics, right? So it's, it's a really a, a dilemma for the male protagonist. He is a prince, so he is naturally an integral part of the political scene. On the other hand, he's under so much pressure, or you can say he's so oppressed um, by his father, the emperor, that he longs to be free. <clears throat> And also here, the title of this sequel to Royal Nirvana is also based on classical poem by the Ming loyalist, uh, Xiao Wanchun. So we don't have to go into that poem, which is why I, I don't provide translation here. But what I want to concentrate on in relation to um, Royal Nirvana is it really represents an important trend uh, in drama series in China uh, and uh, and it is called classical style, <laughs> Gu Feng, or Guo Feng, Chinese style, or more broadly, you can call that Asian aesthetics. It's sort of a pan-Asian phenomenon, but in the case of Chinese classical style, I think they have something special to contribute. In recent years, there are some popular drama series that belong in this, in this category such as the 2018 drama series, The Story of the Yanxi Palace. I'm sure many of you have watched it. I have watched it maybe at least eight, 10 times, okay? And, and also currently what is running on the internet on Tencent, right, uh, is A Dream of Splendor, uh, Meng Hua Lu, uh, which is actually based on um, a classical tale. So we won't have to go into that, but just to give you a sense of how popular a classic drama series is in China. And in this particular drama series, Royal Nirvana, what impresses the audience is that there is so much research that went into the production uh, of this drama series, really in many ways. Uh, it, altogether, these things represent an, a refined and elegant culture of the Song Dynasty even though in the story, they don't say this is Song Dynasty uh, because it's supposed to be fictional, right? In terms of dynasty, but obviously everything is based on uh, Song culture. And this is really a panorama of Song culture 
as we can see here, poetry, classics, calligraphy, painting, and so on. So I will quickly take a look at each category, right? Classical poetry, as we already seen, classical poetry is used a lot uh, by the author of the book, right? And, and this is preserved in the story itself, right? A lot of classical language to begin with, but also a lot of classical poems, such as the most important poem, um, which is the Prince poem on this painting done by the female protagonist, right? Just in this quadrant, there are at least four classical illusions. So it's very interesting. And then also in the drama series, the prince recites these lines from Xu Yan right, to his wife. And, and there are other classical allusions, um, not just poetry, but also these uh, allusions to, for instance, Fan Zhong Yan, this great um, poet and a politician or statesman. And, um, and also other classical illusion, as you can see here, Buddha Sutra, which is, this is a very important illusion that's repeated throughout the drama series, right? This allusion to holding a torch against the wind, which is a, a metaphor for desire. When you have desire, it is like you're holding a torch, walking in the wind, and you are bound to be burned, okay? And also there is that minor illusion to the Han Prince uh, Liu Rui, who was murdered, right? So, so this also appears in the drama series. There are other allusions too, but these are just some of, some of them. And also calligraphy is featured heavily in the drama series. So the, the prince calligraphy itself is called Jin Cuo Da, right? And, and there is a real a historical reference here, right? To Li Yu, whose calligraphy was known as Jin Cuo Dao, but also, of course, based on what we see in the drama series, is modeled after Song Hui Zhong's style, right? Shou Jin Ti. So you can see there. Um, and the tea culture, okay, is featured heavily in the drama series as well. We know that by the Song time, tea has become a very important part of life. And for the, for the elite, of course, it's very, very important. It is a, such an elegant um, sort of cultural activity. And, and this is described in detail in the drama series. A lot of things take place while they are preparing tea for the emperor or for the teacher and so on. So all the uh, uh, utensils and so on. So a lot of research went into it. So they really wanted to highlight Song tea culture. So I guess what is important about uh, this particular drama is that all these sort of cultural activity, all these art forms are not just there superficially as sort of backdrop or decoration, but rather they are an integral part of the plot. Okay? So for instance, tea culture. So in the drama series, the prince never learned how to uh, prepare tea because his father, the emperor, didn't love him, right? So, so the lack of fatherly love, of course, has become a major thing in the drama and it has led to tragedies in the, in the story. So, so anyway, it wasn't until toward the end of the drama series when there was reconciliation between the emperor and the prince that we see them preparing tea, right? So in this case, the emperor asked the prince to, to prepare tea, to have tea with him. And uh, this is where they have a candid heart-to-heart -heart talk about what happened in the past. And also aromatic culture. So again, by the Song times, uh, I think this is more, I mean, Zhi Yi knows more about this, but I think it's still at this time, it's kind of a, an upper class uh, pastime. In other words, people couldn't, who can afford it, right, can, can prepare fragrances right, using all kinds of exotic or domestic herbs and uh, grasses and, uh, and so on. Flowers in this case, <clears throat> plum flower scent. So in this story actually plays an important role, right, because the prince prepared the scent or with the help of his cousin, they prepared the scent. He wanted to give it to the female protagonist, um, but he never could because something happened. Uh, and, 
but he kept this this little sensor, this jar actually, this is a jar of of, um, of aromatics, and uh, so later it, it reappears in the story. So also the music, uh, there was research on classical or traditional Chinese music, and it became the foundation for this original composition by the famous musician uh, Rock Chen, and it was actually performed by the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in London. Okay, so all part of this representation of Song culture. And also rituals and etiquette uh, play a very important role. You can see on the left-hand side, we have the prince wedding ceremony. And on the right-hand side, I mean, every gesture uh, is sort of done meticulously, uh, how to greet people uh, for the upper class, for instance, who should bow to whom. Uh, all these things are not only um, done well in the drama series, but they are part of the storyline. They talk about it to who should bow to who, right? Just to test if, for instance, the female protagonist is put to test to answer these questions. And then garments and accessories all based on Song Dynasty culture. As you can see here, really just beautiful, beautiful clothing and accessories. One of the key accessories, of course, is the gold crane hairpin um, for the female protagonist. And it became you know, a very important instrument at the very end of the tragedy. So now I'm going on to talk about the second case study, The Untamed, okay? And just like Royal Nirvana, uh, it's, it's an adaptation. It's an adaptation of an internet uh, story that became hugely popular. As you can see here, 2015 to 2016, right? And, but the author continued to revise it here and there. Uh, the grandmaster of the demon sect, right? So, so this is a totally different genre from Royal Nirvana. Royal Nirvana is a sort of pseudo or semi-historical uh, drama series, right? Where this one is pure fantasy. It is what we call xianxia xiaoshuo, right? Involves these um, sort of supernatural martial arts figures who are kind of like immortals and, and so on. So it, it's a very um, complicated story, but really well written. And you can see the author's name here, uh, Mo Zhang Tongxiu, okay? and, and became very, very famous. But also she became a little I guess, um, mired in uh, some scandal uh, when it was reported that she was uh, imprisoned for violating some, some law. So anyway, but it be, first became an anime, right? At least part one, as you can see here, serialized um, on Tencent uh, in 2018. And this is the time when the drama series was being produced, right? So they were shooting the drama series where the anime of the story uh, was available. And you can see here, right, they are, uh, the story itself uh, involves uh, something we call Danmei, which we will get to in a few seconds. Um, but, but it is about romance between two gorgeous looking men, right, the two male protagonists in the story, right, so there are explicit thing, uh, scenes of their, their love uh, section sexual love and so on. So, um, and this is what I just alluded to, right? This belongs to the genre, a very popular genre in recent years in China called Danmei, right? And I give it a um, subtitle from aestheticism to homoeroticism because originally started in, um, in Europe actually as a literary trend, a literary style, sort of counter naturalism in the 19th century, right? But of course evolved and it's also based on this. Uh, I mean, when it went into Japan, of course it becomes tanbi, and it literally means indulging in beauty, which means the worship and pursuit of beauty. But then it continued to evolve to become this notion of BL, voice love, okay? So, and then when it's um, translated into Chinese, it became danmei. 
So Tanbi subculture has been very strong in Japan, but also in Korea, Thailand, Taiwan, and China, and so on. Uh, in China, of course, we will talk about it. this is in relation to the drama series, The Untamed. <clears throat> so here you have the two protagonists, right? Uh, Wei Wuxian and Lan Wangji. And the drama series uh, as an adaptation, of course, had to change certain parts of the original story in order to pass censorship, right? Otherwise, this drama series would never have been shown on the internet, right? Had they kept to the original plot, which is Danme, right? Or, or a homoerotic uh, relationship between these two young men. So in the drama series, uh, they start out as quarreling peers, right? They, they are acquainted and they quarrel and, and their personalities are completely different, but eventually they become brothers, right? They're loyal to um, each other. We can even say they become soulmates, but it gets very tricky. Okay, this is what's so, so interesting about this drama series. Uh, that is, what is the relationship between these two young men, right? Are they CP, right? Which stands for a couple, right? CP of course have been around um, in um, drama. For instance, in Korea, even they even give <clears throat> CP awards um, annually, right? To the most uh, beloved couple um, in drama series. And it, it's a very popular award. Uh, so are they a couple? even though the adaptation avoids uh, that part, right? The, the gay love part of the story, but are they still sort of uh, presented as a couple or are they, as some people online say, they're just socialist brothers. In other words, they have um, this socialist brotherhood. Of course you can read it ironically, right? Some people just use this politically correct term to to express what they really want to say, which is they are a couple, right? But if you look at the drama series, certainly there are shots that, or, or um, publicity photos that lead you to think, well, there's more than brotherhood, right? There's more than just fighting for justice together, uh, including what the director said to the actors when they were shooting. So in this particular scene, for instance, on the left, lower left hand corner, as you can see, the director is giving instruction to um, the character Lan Wangji played by Wang Yibo, right? So because Wang Yibo couldn't quite grasp, you know, how he should look at um, uh, Wei Wuji or played by Xiao Zhan. So the director just, just like you're indulging him, you're pampering him, right? Like, uh, I, I guess he didn't say like a parent or like a lover, but I think even the term, right, ni ai, uh, is very suggestive, right? So the director, I don't think he's was completely um, innocent about giving the, the audience the impression that there's something more going on. So here I list some of the details I notice, right? So I call them titillating. In other words, they're highly suggestive because if they were just brothers fighting side by side, I don't think details uh, would be there. Okay, so first of all, uh, in, when he gets drunk one night, uh, he starts sort of sleepwalking. And uh, so Wei has to protect him and he wanders around in the, uh, in the countryside. And he, then he goes into this, um, this uh, family, uh, I guess, yard, backyard, where the family raises chickens. So he just grabs two chickens and gives them to Wei. So he said, are they big and fat chickens? And why? Why this detail? Because actually it's an, it's an old Chinese custom. When people talk about getting married, um, the guy's family is supposed to give chickens to the Bryce family. And then also in this drunken scene, the next morning, when uh, Len, of course, uh, is sober, he's very nervous about what he said the previous night because in his drunkenness, he might have revealed his true feelings. So when Wei sort of teasing, saying, Well, you say you like 
something very much. So Len immediately gets nervous and say, what, what, what did I say I like very much? So then we said, well, you like rabbits a lot because you know, in this story, they, they have this place um, where there are you know, these really cute white bunnies and, and they keep going back to that spot or their spot. But here, why is Len so nervous? Because he's concerned that when he got drunk, he, he maybe revealed his true feelings for a way. So then when we say, oh, you like bunnies very much. So that relaxes him. Um, but also in one scene, uh, they both kneel down before the altar uh, and they offer incense. Of course, this thing is for the uh, deceased foster parents of ways, right? So they passed away. And that's one of the conflict uh, scenes in the story. And uh, so here they pass by. Um, the, the shrine and they want to pre to show respect. But actually the scene portrays them in such a way that you kind of feel like they are almost like uh, performing a, a wedding ceremony, bowing down and offering incense to ancestors um, to, for the ceremony. But anyway, and then also earlier in the drama series, we asked his uh, sister, I mean, actually he's a foster sister, but they are really close, just like, brother and sister. So he asked her, why does a person like another person? I, I mean, that kind of like. So the director, of course, just leaves it there, but obviously implies something more than just liking a friend, right? Or liking a family member or whatever, right? And so, and also the most famous lines in the drama series, right? Is when Lan really wants to protect Wei, right? So he says, So this kind of expression to me okay, uh, is more than brotherhood. You don't say 藏起来. I mean, that almost like I'm going to keeping him um, for myself. Okay. So anyway, but what is fascinating, of course, is that um, in real life are the two young stars, a couple. So the, the, um, the, the production um, or the investors uh, release a lot of behind the scene tidbits. So we get this, these clips, right? About these um, funny scenes or, or uh, enjoyable scenes, so on behind the scene. Um, but in some of these scenes, actually, you feel there's something going on based on the words they say or the expressions or the body language and so on. So, of course, that is always suspicious, right? Because there's editing that went into it. So they show what they want to show us. How do we know, right? Out of context, it's very hard to verify what's really going on. But I think what is intended is the blurred boundary, blurred boundary between fiction and reality. So in fiction, there is something going on, right? Even though it is very subtle because of censorship, they couldn't uh, really follow the, the original plot. Uh, but still, because of a lot of the members of the audience were fans of the book to begin with, right? So they probably wanted to keep those fans. So you can say there are all kinds of motivation that went into this, this drama series. Uh, but in reality, are they a CP or were they a CP? So because of that, there's a lot of tension between so-called dufen, soul fans. In other words, they are only fans of one of these two young stars, right? So there are Xiao Zhan fans and there are Wang Yibo fans, and sometimes they clash. Sometimes they fight fiercely online and offline. But then there are also the special group called CP fans who honestly believe that they are a real couple. Okay. In other words, not just in, in the drama scene, not just on the set, but also in real life. Okay. So I watched hundreds and hundreds of these clips, um, you know, arguing for this or that. So it, it's just very, very interesting, okay. And, um, but what is really worth noting, uh, other than the personal relationship or the fictional relationship, 
is the celebrity worship that is clearly demonstrated by the drama series, right? It, it, it was getting out of control, right? Uh, and that is why I say fan equals fanatic, right? These are really fanatic consumers, right? And also they are extravagant consumers. And on these two stars, these fans, mostly young, of course, right, are willing to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a monthly basis. I'm not talking about total, right? On Xiao Zhan alone, there was an estimate that his fans were spending more than 5,000 RMB per month. I mean, that's an amazing figure, right? Uh, but also these, this leads to a lot of nastiness, right? Even real violence. Uh, there's a lot of trolling online and what in Chinese they call human flesh search. So if someone speaks against Xiao Zhan or Wang Yibo or against drama series, then this person could get into trouble. In fact, in real life, it led to one attempted suicide because that person couldn't take this kind of trolling and, and violent, verbal violence anymore. Um, so anyway, so it, it's a very serious issue. As a result, okay, the authorities uh, were alarmed. And we know that they, they've been watching uh, cyberspace, right, for, for some time now. And uh, Taming the Untamed is the title idea. That is the government intervenes. Uh, first of all, I mentioned Cyberspace Administration of China, but in recent years, it has played a very important role in overseeing and controlling and censoring everything on the internet, right? And also, at least since 2017, uh, the Cyberspace Administration of China uh, has launched this campaign called Clear Action, um, some sort of anti-corruption campaign like what we saw in the PRC before, and it's ongoing. So every year, uh, CAC might announce that this is what we're doing this year, and then a lot of uh, uh, actors got into trouble, uh, a lot of shows got into trouble, and so on. And because of this uh, clear action campaign, right? Basically, it's uh, cleaning up what's going on on the internet. Um, that made drama series uh, is no longer possible, right? Even though after this huge, the phenomenal success of the Untamed, uh, more than two dozen, I think, of drama series were being planned and some were actually produced, they were completed. However, none of them could be shown except for one. So really the last time made drama in recent years uh, is Word of Honor, as you can see on the right-hand side, Shan He Lin, which is to me pretty much a copycat of the Untamed. Of course, the story based on another internet novel is different, but you can see even the poster looks similar to one of the posters of the Untamed, okay? And, but one of the protagonists got into trouble and therefore he, his name has disappeared, right? But the other male protagonist uh, is still doing quite well, okay? But in the foreseeable future, we probably won't see that made drama series um, in China. Okay, so uh, as a very tentative conclusion, really going back to the beginning when we talked about the rise of internet drama series. That is by now, I think since 2018, at least, uh, the internet drama is, has been the mainstream. It is the mainstream and will remain the mainstream in the foreseeable future. The huge capital that goes into internet drama series. I mean, it's almost the reverse, right? Uh, the reverse of what was happening prior to the rise of the internet. Right. Before it was TV and cable TV, and now it is the internet, right? Um, and it's hugely lucrative, right? Uh, we're really talking about billions and billions of dollars for one drama series. Uh, if you look at the Untamed, right, this IP biz model uh, has been extremely successful, right? It remains successful when I use 
you know, a present perfect. I really mean not just when it was first shown, uh, but this is the third year now, right? Uh, since the launch of the drama series, it remains extremely popular, right? So you can see it's not only anime, it's not only um, uh, the drama series itself, of course, it's not only the, the two protagonists who have become number one. There, there's no question about it. Wang Yibo and Xiao Zhan are the two biggest names in China today. And um, they have become mainstream too. Uh, and, uh, and they have tried to avoid this kind of association with Dan Mei, okay? Uh, in their professional life as well as in their personal life. So that itself is very interesting. But if you look at this business model, all the derivative, right, um, commercial products you can see here, and even a uh, restaurant, right, opened in Shanghai, uh, based on the untamed, right? So you can go in and you see these, these uh, scenes and so on, and all the names, of course, and some of the dishes are mentioned in the drama series. Of course, they are on the menu at the restaurant and so on. So, so it's just incredibly profitable, right? When you, when you find your brand. And I think the Untang will continue to be profitable for some time. So, so anyway, this IP business model, it is just uh, very successful. And, and I personally find it intriguing. So I'm gonna stop here. Um, I really didn't keep track of time. So I don't know if I used up my time, but anyway, I hope I didn't go over time. Um, but if I was a, a little short, it, it's okay because that only gives us more time for discussion. And since this is a work in progress, I'm still writing this up as a paper for G. <laughs> and so your comments and suggestions um, are truly welcome and appreciated. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Michelle, for this fascinating talk. Uh, I'm sure many people have uh, questions, and I would ask.